Okay, so line up everyone. Uh, my name is Sensei Bodacious. This is a self-defense class, software self-defense that is. Some of you know me as Gavin uh, on GitHub and other places. I'm often Bodacious on Slack. I'm just Gavin. Um, you can find me somewhere. And if you don't know, I have a first degree black belt in origami. I want you to think about something. I want you to ask yourself, what's the biggest threat to you and your code? Take a look around the room. It's other engineers. It's your squad mates. It's you. So everyone here is a potential threat to the integrity of your code, even you. In this talk, I'm going to show four ways that these ne'er-do-wells might try and attack your code and how you can defend against them. The first kind of attacker I want to describe is the, the state burglar. This is a direct field access attack. Now, these pesky interlopers will break into your objects, rummage around in the internal state, and then leave you to clean up the mess. So I want you to ask yourself, what's one of the most dangerous design patterns you can use in your code? That's right, it's Atter Accessors. Now you might think to yourself, this code looks harmless, but in the wrong hands, this can be devastating. Here's what this kind of attack might look like. We create a new order somewhere, and then someone sets the order number to nil rather than a meaningful string with a proper order number, and sets the order items to some weird hash rather than an array of items. So the problem with this direct field access attack is you don't have control over input values. And that means that you can't ensure valid state, what we call invariance. And if you can't ensure input and state, then you can't guarantee the output values either. But I'm gonna show you how to defend against one of these. So pay attention, I'm only gonna show you this once. Your code should express intent, but not implementation. That means defining methods that do the thing without exposing the underlying behavior. So instead of having an order number, we could have a method that says, oh, sorry, a method that says generate order number and just contain all of the behavior inside of that. So all anything is ever allowed to call is generate order number. And similarly, instead of just having an atter accessor for items, we can define a method to return the items array and then add a new method called add item to allow us to push an item onto the items array, but it doesn't expose the array or knowledge of the array itself. So this code is much safer, much more secure than just using the adder accessors. All right. Next kind of attacker. I call them pickpockets. But this is a state mutation attack. Now, these sneaky saboteurs will meddle with your internal state without you even knowing they've been there. Let's have a look at some code. So this is the order class that we improved previously, and it looks fairly secure now, right? Wrong, wrong. You see, someone could easily come along and just push another item into the items array. Or worse, they could call a method like clear on the order number and just clear out the whole content of that string. Now, they might not even be aware that they've done it. So the problem with this kind of attack is that consumers can still access your state indirectly and they can mutate state without you or maybe even their knowledge. And that can make it very difficult to detect these kinds of issues and to debug them. So I'll show you how to defend against it. Internal state should be completely shielded from the external environment. Um, and this is a fundamental principle that needs to be repeated as many times as possible. 
So there's a few ways that I like to implement something like this. The easy way is just to throw a decoy, return a duplicate, and let them run off thinking that they've changed the items array without actually having changed the internal items array that we care about. Another way you could handle these guys is to raise the alarm, you know, let them try and change a frozen string and see the look on their faces when the alarm bells start to ring. Third kind of attacker you might encounter is the entangler. This is a leaky abstraction attack. Now these sinister control freaks want to get right up in your business and entangle and ensnare you until you are completely immobilized. Let's extend some of the code that we've been working on with the concept of confirming an order. So we're adding a status to the order class now and total price. Now we've been really diligent and secure and we've said that total price is a method that's returning the total price. Because it's an integer, we don't need to worry about freezing it. Integers are already frozen. Uh, sorry, it's a money object in this case. Money objects are already frozen, so we don't need to worry about that. And the setter here is casting the value to an integer and then as a money object. So we know we can trust that our total price is going to be a money object. Similarly, our status method is returning a symbol, which is already frozen. So we don't need to worry about the other two kinds of attacks we've already seen here. This code is secure. However, the way that this code is currently written, when someone comes along to confirm an order in a controller or God forbid, a service object, uh, they will probably do something that looks like this. And the problem here is that the knowledge of how to confirm an order is not concretely defined inside the order code. It's actually implicit and then it's scattered around one or maybe more objects outside of the order code. So we say that this abstraction is leaking into other parts of the code. And this makes this code dangerous because it's difficult to change and it's difficult to change without affecting other parts of the system as well. So the problem with leaky abstraction is that the consumer knows too much about the abstraction confirm in this case. Knowledge of how to do these changes is not concretely defined, it's more implicit. You have to know a lot about the order class in order to uh, confirm an order. And this also makes it really easy to introduce bugs through error. I mean, if you just consider if somebody misses out one of the steps involved here, then they can break it and not know why. And again, this makes changes to the code a lot more risky and so a lot more expensive. I'm going to show you how to defend against one of these. So behavior should be internal and explicit, not implicit. We could reimagine our order class more like this, where we have a predicate method to ask, may I confirm this order? And then the behavior for how to actually confirm the order is all encapsulated within the order. So we're setting the status to confirmed. We're holding each of the items in the order. And then we are taking the current price as being the sum of all of the items at their current price. And that means that our controller code then, all it has to know is that if I may confirm the order, then I confirm the order. You could take this concept a step further and you could actually move the may confirm check inside the confirm method. And then your controller might just look something like order confirm. So that's much more tightly encapsulated and we're not leaking the knowledge of how to uh, confirm an order anymore. We're just confirming the order. So the last kind of attacker that you might encounter, I call them psychic mind invaders. Now, these mind invaders, they want to bypass your defenses entirely and read your innermost thoughts. Let's have a look at how this attack works. So just consider this simple code where we have an order class and it can generate a unique number, but that's a private method. We don't want anybody to know how we generate a unique number or even that we do have this method. And we have an instance variable called status, but we haven't exposed that publicly as a public method. 
And then one of these guys comes along and says, instance variable set and changes the, the value of the status instance variable to something different. Or they call the send method to directly talk to our private methods inside the order class. Now I'm going to tell you how to defend against one of these. Oh, sorry, my slides messed up there. Uh, how to defend against one of these guys? You can't run, just run, and hope that you can outrun your friends. Um, Ruby is really dynamic and flexible, but it gives you these ways to bypass the, the private barriers that we set up, the access control barriers that we set up on our classes. And there's just no way around it. You cannot escape. It is too powerful. But you should never need to use these. If you are reaching for these tools in your code, then it means that you're probably doing something wrong. OK, well, there is one way, actually, that you can defend yourself from these. But you have to promise me you will never use it. It is just too dangerous, and you didn't hear it from me. Uh, you can call undef, which is to undefine a method. And you can actually undefine these dangerous methods on your class. Now, as I said, this is way too dangerous to actually use. These are really advanced moves, and you know I'm not responsible for what happens if you actually do use them. So please don't ever try those, but they do exist. Um, with the private bypassing, you should need to understand that we should enforce public interface methods at all times. That means if you want to change the state, then call a method that will do that internally. And if you want to use the public send method to send a message that a method ought to be sent, then that's totally fine. Just not the, the send method, which can access private methods uh, as well. So to recap on all of that, prefer methods over attribute setters. The code should express intent, but not implementation. Ensure that any exposed state is immutable. Now, sometimes this is intrinsic with examples of uh, Booleans, symbols, integers. Uh, these are all frozen in Ruby. But if the return values themselves are not frozen, then take extra steps to protect yourself there. Uh, examples that we showed were duplicating and returning a duplicate or actually freezing the object if you don't need to change it. Hide the inner workings behind an interface. Uh, behavior should be internal and explicit, not implicit. Uh, if you find yourself getting and setting two or more properties on an object that is um, outside of the class itself, you're probably doing something wrong. And finally, avoid methods that allow access to hidden information. Sometimes the best defense is just a good pair of running shoes. Run for the hills when you see this sort of thing. I'm happy to open up to any questions. I hope that's been helpful. Um, but otherwise, yeah, stay safe, everyone.